All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my house. Um, this is my couch. This is my living room. This is my dog with this cone of shame. And today we are going to read the first couple of chapters of Legend by Marie Lu. Um, this is a book I truly, really, really enjoy. So I'm excited to share this with you. So we'll get started. Los Angeles, California, Republic of America. Population, 20,174,282. Part one, the boy who walks in the light. Day. My mother thinks I'm dead. Obviously I'm not dead, but it's safer for her to think so. At least twice a month, I see my wanted poster flashed on the jumbotrons scattered through downtown Los Angeles. It looks out of place up there. Most of the pictures on the screens are happy things. Smiling children standing under a bright blue sky, tourists posing before the Golden Gate ruins, Republic commercials in neon colors. There's also anti-colonies propaganda. The colonies want our land, the ads declare. They want what they can't have. They don't let them conquer our, your homes, support the cause. Then there's my criminal report. It lights up the jumbotrons in all its multicolored glory. Wanted by the Republic. File number 462-178-3233. Day. Wanted for assault, arson, theft, destruction of military property, and hindering the war effort. 200,000 Republic notes for information leading to arrest. They always have a different photo running alongside the report. One time it was a boy with glasses and a head full of thick copper curls. Another time it was a boy with black eyes and no hair at all. Sometimes in black, sometimes white, sometimes olive or brown or yellow or red, or whatever else they can think of. In other words, the Republic has no idea what I look like. They don't seem to know much of anything about me, except that I'm young, and that when they run my fingerprints, they don't find a match in their databases. That's why they hate me. Why I'm not the most dangerous criminal in the country, but the most wanted. I make them look bad. It's early evening, but it's already pitch black outside, and the Jumbotron's reflections are visible in the street's puddles. I sit on the crumbling window ledge three stories up, hidden from view behind rusted steel beams. This used to be an apartment complex, but it's fallen into disrepair. Broken lanterns and glass shards litter the floor of this room, and paint is peeling from every wall. In one corner, an old portrait of the Elector Primo lies face up on the ground. I wonder who used to live here. No one's cracked enough to let their portrait of the Elector sit discarded on the floor like that. My hair, as usual, is tucked inside an old newsboy cap. My eyes are fixed on the small one-story house across the road. My hands fiddle with the pendant tied around my neck. Tess leans against the room's other window, watching me closely. I'm restless tonight, and as always, she can sense it. The plague has hit the lake sector hard. In the glow of the jumbotrons, Tess and I can see the soldiers at the end of the street as they inspect each home, their black capes shiny and worn loose in the heat. Each of them wears a gas mask. Sometimes when they emerge, they mark a house by painting a big red X on the front door. No one enters or leaves the home after that, at least not when anyone's looking. Still don't see them, Tess whispers. Shadows conceal her expression. In an attempt to distract myself, I'm piecing together a makeshift slingshot out of old PVC pipes. They haven't eaten dinner. They haven't sat down by the table in hours. I shift and stretch out my bad knee. Maybe they're not home? I shoot Tess an irritated glance. She's trying to console me, but I'm not in the mood. A lamp's lit. Look at those candles. Mom would never waste candles if no one was home. Tess moves closer. We should leave the city for a couple weeks, yeah? She tries to keep her voice calm, but the fear is there. Soon the plague will have blown through, and you can come back to visit. We have more than enough money for two train tickets. I shake my head. One night a week, remember? Just let me check up on them. One night a week. Yeah, you've been coming here every night this week. I just want to make sure they're okay. What if you get sick? I'll take my chances. And you didn't have to come with me. You could have waited for me back in Alta. Tess shrugs. Somebody has to keep an eye on you. Two years younger than me. Although sometimes she sounds old enough to be my caretaker. We look on in silence as the soldiers draw closer to my family's house. Every time they stop at a home, one soldier pounds on the door while a second stands with him with his gun drawn. If no one opens the door within 10 seconds, the first soldier kicks it in. I can't see them once they rush inside, but I know the drill. 
A soldier will draw a blood sample from each family member, then plug it in a handheld reader and check for the plague. The whole process takes ten minutes. I count the houses between where the soldiers are now and where my family lives. I'll have to wait another hour before I know their fate. A shriek echoes from the other side of the street. My eyes dart toward the sound, and my hand whips to the knife sheathed in my belt. Tess sucks in her breath. It's a plague victim. She must have been deteriorating for months because her skin is cracked and bleeding everywhere, and I find myself wondering how the soldiers could have missed this one during previous inspections. She stumbles around for a while, disoriented, then charges forward, only to trip and fall to her knees. I glance back toward the soldiers. They see her now. The soldier with the drawn weapon approaches, while the eleven others stay where they are and look on. One plague victim isn't much of a threat. The soldier lifts his gun and aims. A volley of sparks engulfs the infected woman. She collapses, then goes still. The soldier rejoins his comrades. I wish we could get our hands on one of the soldier's guns. A pretty weapon like that doesn't cost much on the market. 480 notes? Less than a stove. Like all guns, it has precision, guided by magnets and electric currents, and can accurately shoot a target three blocks away. It's tech stolen from the colonies, Dead One said. Although, of course, the Republic would never tell you that. Tess and I could buy five of them if we wanted. Over the years, we've learned to stockpile the extra money we steal and stash it away for emergencies. But the real problem with having a gun isn't the expense. It's that it's so easy to trace back to you. Each gun has a sensor on it that reports its user's hand shape, thumbprints, and location. If that didn't give me away, nothing would. So I'm left with my homemade weapons. PVC pipe slingshots, and other trinkets. They found another one, Tess says. She squints to get a better look. I look down and see the soldiers spill from another house. One of them shakes a can of, red spray, a can, a can of spray paint and draws a giant red X on the door. I know that house. The family that lives there once had a little girl my age. My brothers and I played with her when we were younger. Freeze tag and street hockey with iron pokers and crumbled paper. Tess tries to distract me by knocking, nodding at the cloth bundle near my feet. What'd you bring them? I smile, then reach down to untie the cloth. Some of the stuff we saved up this week. It'll make a nice celebration once they pass the inspection. I dig through the little pile of goodies inside the bundle, then hold up a used pair of goggles. I check them again to make sure there are no cracks in the glass. For John, an early birthday gift. My older brother turns 19 later this week. He works 14-hour shifts in the neighborhood's plants, in the neighborhood plants, friction stoves, and always comes home rubbing his eyes from the smoke. These goggles were a lucky steal from a military supply shipment. I put them down and shuffle through the rest of the stuff. It's mostly tins of meat and potato hash I stole from an airship's cafeteria, and an old pair of shoes with intact soles. I wish I could be in the room with all of them when I deliver this stuff. But John's the only one who knows I'm alive, and he's promised not to tell Mom or Eden. Eden turns ten in two months, which means that in two months, he'll have to take the trial. I failed my own trial when I was ten. That's why I worry about Eden, because even though he's easily the smartest of all three of us boys, he thinks a lot like I do. When I finished my trial, I felt so sure of my answers that I didn't even bother to watch them grade it. But then the admins ushered me into a corner of the trial stadium with a bunch of other kids. They stamped something on my test and stuffed me into a train headed downtown. I didn't get to take anything except the pendant I wore on my neck. I didn't even get to say goodbye. Several different things could happen after you take the trial. You get a perfect score, 1,500 points. No one's ever gotten this. Well, except for some kid a few years ago who the military made a gaudy fuss over. Who knows what happens to someone with a score that high? Probably lots of money and power, yeah? You score between a 1450 and a 1499. Pat yourself on the back, because you'll get instant access to six years of high school, then four to the top universities in the Republic. Drake, Stanford, and Brennan. Then, Congress hires you, and you make lots of money. Joy and happiness follow, at least according to the Republic. You get a good score, somewhere between 1250 and 1449 points. You get to continue on to high school, and then you're assigned to a college. Not bad. You squeak by with a score between 1000 and 1249. Congress bars you from high school. You join the poor, like my family. You'll probably either drown while working the water turbines or get steamed to death in the power plants. You fail. It's almost always the slum sector kids who fail. If you're in this unlucky category, the Republic sends officials to your family's homes. They make your parents sign a contract, giving the government full custody over you. They say that you've been sent away to the Republic's labor camps, 
and that your family will not see you again. Your parents have to nod and agree. A few even celebrate because the Republic gives them 1,000 notes as a condolence gift. Money and one less mouth to feed? What a thoughtful government. Except all this is a lie. An inferior child with bad genes is no use to the country. If you're lucky, Congress will let you die without first sending you to the labs to be examined for imperfections. Five houses remain. Tess sees the worry in my eyes and puts a hand on my forehead. One of your headaches coming on? No, I'm okay. I peer to the open window at my mother's house, then catch my first glimpse of a familiar face. Eden walks by, then picks out the window, peeks out the window at the approaching soldiers and points some handmade metal contraption at them. Then he ducks back inside and disappears from view. His curls flash white blonde in the flickering lamplight. Knowing him, he probably built the gadget to measure how far away someone is or something like that. He looks thinner, I mutter. He's alive and walking around, Tess replies. I'd say that's a win. Minutes later, we see John and my mother wander past the window, deep in conversation. John and I look pretty similar, although he's grown a bit stockier from long days at the plant. His hair, like most who live in our sector, hangs down past his, sol soldier, past his shoulders and is tied back into a simple tail. His vest is smudged with red clay. I can tell Mom's scolding him for something or another, probably le for letting Eden peek out the window. She bats John's hand away when a bout of her chronic coughing hits her. I let out a breath. So, at least all three of them are healthy enough to walk. Even if one of them is infected, it's early enough that they'll still have a chance to recover. I can't stop imagining what will happen if the soldier marks my mother's door. My family will stand frozen in our living room long after the soldiers have left. Then Mom will put on her usual brave face, only to sit up through the night, quietly wiping tears away. In the morning, they'll start receiving small rations of food and water, and simply wait to recover. Or die. My mind wanders to the stash of stolen money that Tess and I have hidden. 2,500 notes. Enough to feed us for months, but not enough to buy my family vials of plague medicine. The minutes drag on. I tuck my slingshot away and play a few rounds of rock, paper, scissors with Tess. I don't know why, but she's crazy good at this game. I glance several times at my mother's window, but don't see anyone. They must have gathered near the door, ready to open it as soon as they hear a fist against the wood. And then the time comes. I lean forward on the ledge, so, the far, so far that Tess grips my arm to make sure I don't topple to the ground. The soldiers pound on the door. My mother opens it immediately, lets the soldiers in, and then closes it. I strain to hear voices, footsteps, anything that might come from my house. The sooner this is all over, the sooner I can sneak my gifts to John. The silence drags on. Tess whispers, No news is good news, right? Very funny. I count off the seconds in my head. One minute passes. Then two. Then four. And then finally, ten minutes. Then fifteen minutes. Twenty minutes. I look at Tess. She just shrugs. Maybe their reader's broken, she suggests. 30 minutes pass. I don't dare move from my vigil. I'm afraid something will happen so quickly that I'll miss it if I blink. My fingers tap rhythmically against the hilt of my knife. 40 minutes. 50 minutes. An hour. Something's wrong, I whisper. Tess purses her lips. You don't know that. Yes, I do. What could possibly take this long? Tess opens her mouth to reply, but before she can say anything, the soldiers are exiting my house, single file, expressionless. Finally, the last soldier shuts the door behind him and reaches for something tucked at his waist. I suddenly feel dizzy. I know what's coming. The soldier reaches up and sprays one long red diagonal line on our door. Then he sprays another line, making an X. I curse silently under my breath and start to turn away. But then the soldier does something unexpected, something I've never seen before. He sprays a third vertical line at my mother's door, cutting the X in half. June. 1347 hours. Drake University, Batala Sector. 72 degrees Fahrenheit indoors. I'm sitting in my dean's secretary's office, again. On the other side of the frosted glass door, I can see a bunch of my classmates. Seniors, all at least four years older than me, hanging around in an attempt to hear what's going on. Several of them saw me being yanked out of our afternoon drill class. Today's lesson, how to load and unload an XM621 rifle. 
by a menacing pair of guards. And whenever that happens, the news spreads all over campus. The Republic's favorite little prodigy is in trouble again. The office is quiet except for the faint hum coming from the Dean's secretary's computer. I've memorized every detail of this room. Hand-cut marble floors imported from Dakota, 324 plastic square tile ceiling tiles, 20 feet of gray drapes hanging on either side of the glorious elector's portrait on the office's back wall, a 30-inch screen on the side wall, and the sound muted, with the sound muted, and a headline that reads, Traitorous Patriots Group Bombs Local Military Station Kills Five, followed by, Republic Defeats Colonies in Battle for Hillsborough. Arisna Whittaker, the dean secretary herself, is seated behind her desk, tapping on its glass, no doubt tidying up my, typing up my report. This will be my eighth report this quarter. I'm willing to bet I'm the only Drake student who's ever managed to get eight reports in one quarter without being expelled. Injured your hand yesterday, Ms. Whitaker? I say after a while. She stops typing to glare at me. What makes you think that, Miss Paris? The pauses on your keystrokes are off. You're favoring your left hand. Miss Whitaker sighs and leans back in her chair. Yes, June. I twisted my wrist yesterday in a game of Kiva Ball. Sorry to hear it. You should try to swing more from your arm and not from your wrist. I'd meant this simply to be a statement of fact, but it sounded sort of taunting and doesn't seem to have made her any happier. Let's get something straight, Miss Paris, she says. You may think you're very smart. You may think your perfect grades are new some sort of special treatment. You may even think you have fans at the school. What with all this nonsense? She gestures that to the, at the students gathered outside the door. But I've grown incredibly tired of your get-togethers in my office. And believe me, when you graduate and get assigned to whatever post this country chooses for you, your antics won't impress your superiors there. Do you understand me? I nod because that's what she wants me to do. But she's wrong. I don't just think I'm smart. I'm the only person in the entire Republic with a perfect 1500 score on her trial. I was assigned here, to the country's top university, at 12, four years ahead of schedule. Then I skipped my sophomore year. I've earned perfect grades at Drake for three years. I am smart. I have what the Republic considers good genes. And better genes make for better soldiers, make for better chances of victory against the colonies, my professors always say. And if I feel like my afternoon drills aren't teaching me enough about how to climb walls while carrying weapons, then, well, it wasn't my fault I had to scale the side of a 19-story building with an XM-621 gun strapped to my back. It was self-improvement for the sake of my country. Rumor has it that Day once scaled five stories in less than eight seconds. If the Republic's most wanted criminal can pull that off, then how are we ever going to catch him if we're not just as fast? And if we can't even catch him, how are we going to win the war? Miss Whitaker's desk beeps three times. She holds down a button. Yes? Captain Matias Aparis is outside the gate, a voice replies. He's here for his sister. Good, send him in. She releases the button and points a finger at me. I hope that brother of yours starts doing a better job of minding you, because if you end up in my office one more time this quarter... Matias is doing a better job than our dead parents, I reply, maybe more sharply than I intended. We fall into an uncomfortable silence. Finally, after what seems like an eternity, I hear a commotion out in the hall. The students pressed against the doors. Glass abruptly disperse, and their shadows move aside to make room for a tall silhouette. My brother. As Matias opens the door and steps inside, I can see some girls out in the hall stifling smiles behind their hands. But Matias fixes his full attention on me. We have the same eyes, black with a gold glint, the same long lashes and dark hair. The long lashes work particularly well for Matias. Even with the door closed behind him, I can still hear the whispers and giggles from outside. It looks like he came from his patrol duties straight to my campus. He's decked out in full uniform. Black officer coat with double rows of gold buttons. Gloves. Neoprene. Spectral lining. Captain rank embroidery. Shining epaulets on his shoulders. Formal military hat. Black trousers. Polished boots. My eyes meet his. He's furious. Miss Whitaker gives Matias a brilliant smile. Ah, Captain, she exclaims. It's a pleasure to see you. Matias taps the edge of his hat in a polite salute. It's unfortunate it's under these circumstances again, he replies. My apologies. Not a problem, Captain. The Dean Secretary waves her hand dismissively. What a brown noser. Especially after what she just said about Matias. 
It's hardly your fault. Your sister was caught scaling a high-rise during her lunch hour today. She'd wandered two blocks off campus to do it. As you know, students are only to use the climbing walls on campus for physical training, and leaving the campus in the middle of the day is forbidden. Yes, I'm aware of that, Matthias interrupts, looking at me out of the corner of his eye. I saw the helicopters over Drake at noon and had a suspicion June might have been involved. There'd been three helicopters. They couldn't get me off the side of the building by scaling it themselves, so they pulled me off with a net. Thank you for your help, Matthias said to the dean's secretary. He snaps his fingers at me, my cue to get up. When June returns to campus, she'll be on her best behavior. I ignore Miss Whitaker's false smile as I follow my brother out of the office and into the hall. Immediately, students hurry over. June, a boy named Dorian says as he tags alongside us. He'd asked me, unsuccessfully, to the annual Drake Ball two years in a row. Is it true? How high up did you get? Matthias cuts him off with a stern look. June's heading home. Then he puts a hand firmly on my shoulder and guides me away from my classmates. I glance behind me and manage to smile, a smile for them. Fourteen floors, I call back. That gets them buzzing again. Somehow, this has become the closest relationship I have with the other Drake students. I'm respected, discussed, gossiped about, not really talked to. Such is the life of a 15-year-old senior in a university meant for 16 and up. Matthias doesn't say another word as we make our way down the corridors, past the manicured lawns of the central quad and the glorious Elector statue and finally through one of the indoor gyms. We pass the, by the afternoon drills I'm supposed to be participating in. I watch my classmates run along the, the giant track surrounded by a 360 degree screen, simulating some desolate war front road. They're holding their rifles out in front of them, attempting to load and unload as fast as they can while running. At most other universities, there wouldn't be so many student soldiers, but at Drake, almost all of us are well on our way to career assignments in the Republic's military. A few others are tapped for politics and Congress, and some are chosen to stay behind and teach. But Drake is the military's is, is the Republic's best university, and seeing how the best are always assigned to the, into the military, our drill room is packed with students. By the time we reach one of Drake's outer streets, and I climb into the back seat of our waiting military jeep, Matthias can barely contain his anger. Suspended for a week? Do you want to explain this to me? He demands. I get back from a morning of dealing with the Patriot rebels, and what do I hear about? Helicopters, two blocks from Drake, a girl scaling a skyscraper. I exchange a friendly look with Thomas, the soldier in the driver's seat. Sorry, I mutter. Matthias turns around from his place in the passenger seat and narrows his eyes at me. What the hell were you thinking? Did you know you'd wander right off campus? Yes. Of course. You're 15. You went 14 floors up a... He takes a deep breath closes his eyes, and steadies himself. For once, I'd appreciate it if you would let me do my daily tours of duty without worrying myself sick over what you're up to. I try to meet Thomas's eyes again in the rearview mirror, but he keeps his gaze on the road. Of course, I shouldn't expect any help from him. He looks as tidy as ever with his perfectly slicked hair and perfectly ironed uniform, not a strand or thread out of place. Out of place. Thomas might be several years younger than Matthias and a subordinate on his patrol, but he's more disciplined than anyone I know. Sometimes I wish I had that much discipline. He probably disapproves of my stunts even more than Matias does. We leave downtown Los Angeles behind and travel up the winding highway in silence. The scenery changes from inner Batalla sectors, hundred floor skyscrapers to densely packed bar um, barrack towers and civilian complexes. Each one only 20 to 30 stories high with red guiding lights blinking on their roofs. Most of all, with all their paint stripped off after this year's rash of storms. Metal support beams crisscross their walls. I hope they get to upgrade those supports soon. The war's been intense lately, and with several decades of infrastructure funded, funding diverted to supplying the war front, I don't know if these buildings would hold up in, well in another earthquake. After a few minutes, Matthias continues in a calmer voice. You really scared me today, he says. I was afraid they'd mistake you for day and shoot at you. I know he doesn't mean this as a compliment, but I can't help smiling. I lean forward to rest my arms on top of his seat. Hey, I say, tugging his ear, the way I did when I was a kid. I'm sorry I made you worry. He lets out a scornful chuckle. I can tell his anger is already fading. Yeah, that's what you say every time, Junebug. Is Drake not keeping you, your brain busy enough? If not, then I don't know what will. You know, 
if you'd just take me along on some of your missions, I'd probably learn a lot more and stay out of trouble. Nice try. You're not going anywhere until you graduate and get assigned to your own patrol. I bite my tongue. Miss Matias did pick me once, once, for a mission last year, when all third-year Drake students had to shadow an assigned military branch. His commander sent him to kill a runaway prisoner of war from the colonies. So Matias brought me along with him, and together we chased the POW deeper and deeper into our territory, away from the dividing fences and the strip of land running from Dakota to West Texas that separates the Republic and the colonies, away from the war front where sh airships dot the sky. I tracked him into an alley in Yellowstone City, Montana, and Matias shot him. During the chase, I broke three ribs and had a knife buried in my leg. Now, Matias refuses to take me anywhere. When Matias finally speaks again, he sounds grudgingly curious. So, tell me, he whispers, how fast did you climb those 14 stories? Thomas makes a disapproving sound in his throat, but I break into a grin. Storm's passed. Matias loves me again. Six minutes, I whisper back to my brother. And 44 seconds. How do you like that? That must be some kind of record. Not that, you know, you're supposed to do it. Thomas stops the jeep right behind the lines at the red light and gives Matias an exasperated look. Come on, Captain, he says. June, uh, Miss Paris, won't learn a thing if you keep praising her for breaking the rules. Cheer up, Thomas. Matias reaches over and claps him on the back. Surely breaking a rule once in a while is tolerable. Especially, especially if you're doing it to beef up your skills for the Republic's sake. Victory against the colonies, right? The light blinks green. Thomas turns his eye back to the road. He seems to count to three in his head before letting the jeep go forward. Right, he mutters. You should still be careful what you're encouraging Miss Paris to do, especially with your parents gone. Matthias's mouth tightens into a line, and a familiar, strained look appears in his eyes. No matter how sharp my intuition is, no matter how well I do at Drake, or how perfectly I score in defense and target practice and hand-to-hand -hand combat, Matias's eyes always hold that fear. He's afraid something might happen to me one day, like the car crash that took our parents. That fear never leaves his face, and Thomas knows it. I didn't know our parents long enough to miss them in the same way Matias does. Whenever I cry over losing them, I cry because I don't have any memories of them. Just hazy recollections of long adult legs shuffling around our apartment, and hands lifting me from my high chair. That's it. Every other memory from my childhood, looking out onto the auditorium as I receive an award, or having soup made for me when I'm sick, or being scolded, or tucked into bed, those are with Matias. We drive past half of Batala sector and through a few poor blocks. Can't these street beggars stay a little farther from our Jeep? Finally, we reach the gleaming terraced high rises of Ruby, and we're home. Matias gets out first. As I follow, Thomas gives me a small smile. See you later, Miss Paris, he says, tipping his hat. I've stopped trying to convince him to call me June. We'll never change. Still, it's not so bad being called something proper. Maybe when I'm older and Matias doesn't faint at the idea of me dating. Bye, Thomas. Thanks for the ride. I smile back at him before stepping out of the Jeep. Matias waits until the door is slammed shut before turning to me and lowering his voice. I'll be home late tonight, he says. There's that tension in his eyes again. Don't go out alone. News from the war front is they're cutting power to res residences tonight to save energy for the airfield bases. So stay, pu stay put, okay? The streets will be darker than usual. My heart sinks. I wish the Republic would hurry up and win this war already, so that for once we might, might actually get a whole month of nonstop electricity. Where are you going? Can I come with you? I'm overseeing the lab at Los Angeles, Los Angeles Central. They're delivering vials of some mutated virus there. I shouldn't take all night. And I already told you, no. No missions. Matias hesitates. I'll be home as early as I can. We have a lot to talk about. He puts his hands on my shoulder, ignores my puzzled look, and gives me a quick kiss on my forehead. Love you, Junebug, he says, his trademark goodbye. He turns to climb back into the Jeep. I'm not going to wait up for you, I call after him. But by now, he's already inside, and the Jeep's pulling away with him inside of it. Be careful, I murmur. But it's pointless to say now. Matias is too far away to hear me. Day. When I was seven years old, my father came home from the war front for a week's leave. His job was to clean up after the Republic soldiers, so he was usually gone, and Mom was left to raise us boys on her own. When he came home that time, 
The city patrols did a routine inspection of her house, then dragged Dad off to the local police headquarters for questioning. They'd found something suspicious, I guess. The police brought him back with two broken arms, his face bloody and bruised. Several nights later, I dipped a ball of crushed ice into a can of gasoline, let the oil coat the ice in a thick layer, and lit it. Then I launched it with a slingshot through the window of our local police headquarters. I remember the fire trucks that came whizzing around the corner shortly thereafter, and the charred remains of the police building's west wing. They never found out who did it, and I never came forward. There was, after all, no evidence. I had committed my first perfect crime. My mother used to hope that I would rise up from my humble roots, become someone successful, or even famous. I'm famous, all right, but I don't think it's what she had in mind. It's nightfall again, a good 48 hours since the soldiers marked my mother's door. I wait in the shadows of a back alley, one block from the Los Angeles, Los Angeles Central Hospital, and watch its staff spill in and out of the main entrance. It's a cloudy night with no moon, and I can't even make out the crumbling bank tower sign at the top of the building. Electric lights shine from each floor, a luxury only government building and the elite's home can a luxury only government buildings and the elite's homes can aff afford. Military jeeps stack up along the street as they wait for approval to enter the underground parking lots. Someone checks them for proper IDs. I keep still, my eyes fixed on the entrance. I look pretty awesome tonight. I'm wearing my good pair of shoes, boots made out of dark leather worn soft over time, with strong laces and steel toes. Bought them with 150 notes from our stash. I've hidden a knife flat against the sole of each boot. When I shift my feet, I can feel the cool metal against my skin. My black trousers are tucked, tucked into my boots, and I carry a pair of gloves and a black handkerchief in my pockets. A dark, long sleeve shirt is tied around my waist. My hair hangs loose down by my shoulders. This time, I've sprayed my white blonde strands a deep black, as if I've dipped them in a crude oil. Earlier in the day, Tess had traded five notes for a bucket of pygmies, pygmy pig's blood from the back alley of the kitchen. My arms, stomach, and face are smeared with it. I've also streaked mud on my cheeks for good measure. The hospital spans the first 12 floors of the building, but I'm only interested in the one without windows. That's the third floor, a laboratory, where the blood samples and medicines will be. From the outside, the third floor is completely hidden behind elaborate stone carvings and worn Republic flags. Behind the facade lies a vast floor with no halls and no doors, just a gigantic room, doctors and nurses behind white masks test tubes and pipettes, incubators and gurneys. I know this because I've been there before. I was there the day I failed my trial, the day I was supposed to die. My eyes scan the side of the tower. Sometimes I can break into a building by running it from the outside, if there are balconies to leap from and window ledges to balance on. I once scaled a four-story building in less than five seconds, but this tower is too smooth with no footholds. I'll have to reach the lab from inside, I shiver a little in the warmth and wish I asked Tess to come with me. I, the two, but, but two trespassers are easier to catch than one. Besides, it's not her family who needs the medicine. I check to make sure I've tucked my pendant beneath my shirt. A lone medic truck pulls up behind the military jeeps. Several soldiers climb out and greet the nurses while others unpack the truck boxes. The leader of the group is a young, dark-haired man dressed in all black, except for two rows of silver buttons that line his officer jacket. I strain to hear what he's saying from one of the nurses. To one of the nurses. From around the lake's edge, the man tightens his gloves. I catch a glimpse of the gun at his belt. My men will be at the entrances tonight. Yes, Captain, the nurse says. The man tips his cap to her. My name's Matthias. If you have any questions, come see me. I wait until the soldiers have spread out across the hospital's perimeter, and the man named Matthias has immersed himself in conversation with two of his men. Several more medic trucks come and go dropping off soldiers, some with broken limbs, some with gashes on their heads or lacerations on their legs. I take a deep breath, then step out of the shadows and stumble toward the hospital's entrance. A nurse spots me first, just outside the main doors. Her eyes dart to the blood on my arms and face. Can I be admitted, cousin? I call to her. I wince in imaginary pain. Is there still room tonight? I can pay. She looks at me without pity before she returns to scribbling on a notepad. Guess she doesn't appreciate the cousin affection. An ID tag dangles from her neck. What happened? She asks. I double over when I reach her and lean on my knees. Was it a fight? I say panting. I think I got stabbed. The nurse doesn't look back at me. She finishes writing and nods to one of the guards. Pat him down. I stay where I am as two soldiers check me for weapons. 
a yelp on cue where they t- when they touch my arms or stomach. They don't find the knives tucked in my boots. They do take the little pouch of notes tied to my belt. My payment for entering the hospital, of course. If I was a gaudy rich sector boy, I'd be admitted without charge. Or they'd send a doctor for free straight up to where I live. When the soldiers give the nurse a thumbs up, she points me toward the entrance. Waiting room's on the left. Have a seat. I thank her and stumble toward the sliding doors. The man named Matthias watches me as I pass. He's listening patiently to one of his soldiers, but I see him study my face as as if out of habit. I make a mental note of his face, too. The hospital is ghostly white on the inside. To my left, I see the waiting room, just like the nurse said, a huge space packed with people sporting injuries of all shapes and sizes. Many of them moan in pain. One person lies unmoving on the floor. I don't want to guess how long some of them have been here, or how much they had to pay to get in. I note where all the soldiers are standing, two by the secretary's window, two by the doctor's door far in the distance, several near the elevators, each wearing ID tags, and then I drop my eyes to the floor. I shuffle to the closest chair and sit. For once, my bad knee helps with my disguise. I keep my hands pressed against my side for good measure. I count ten minutes off the top of my head, long enough so that I can so that new patients have arrived in the waiting room and soldiers are less interested in me. Then I stand up, pretend to stumble, and lurch toward the the closer soldier. His hand reflexively moves to his gun. Sit back down, he says. I trip and fall against him. I need the bathroom, I whisper, my voice hoarse. My hands tremble as I grab his black robes for balance. The soldiers look look at me in disgust while some of the others snicker. I see his hands creep closer to the gun's trigger. But one of the other soldiers shakes his head. No shooting in a hospital. The soldiers pushes me. The soldier pushes me away and points toward the end of the hall with his gun. Over there, he snaps. Wipe some of that filth off your face. And if you touch me again, I'll fill you with bullets. I release him and nearly fall to my knees. Then I turn and stagger toward the restroom. My leather boots squeak against the t- floor tiles. I can feel the soldier's eyes on me as I enter the bathroom and lock the door. No matter. They'll forget about me in a couple of minutes. And it'll take several more minutes before the soldier I'd grabbed realizes his ID tag is missing. Once in the bathroom, I abandon my sick routine. I splash water in my face and scrub until most of the pig's blood and mud have come off. I unzip my boots and tear open the inner soles to reveal my knives, then tuck them into my belt. My boots go back on my feet. Then I untie the black collared shirt from around my waist and put it on, buttoning it all the way up to my neck and clipping my suspenders over it. I pull my hair back into a tight ponytail and tuck the tail into the shirt so that it's pressed flat against my back. Finally, I pull my gloves on and tie a black handkerchief around my mouth and nose. If someone catches me now, I'll be forced to run anyway. Might as well hide my face. When I finish, I use the tip of one of my knives to unscrew the cover of the bathroom's ventilation shaft. Then I take out the soldier's ID tag, clip it to my pendant necklace, and stuff myself headfirst into the shaft's tunnel. The air in the shaft smells strange and I'm grateful for the handkerchief around my face. I inch along as fast as I can. The shaft can't be more than two feet wide in any direction. Each time I pull myself forward, I have to close my eyes and remember and remind myself to breathe, that the metal walls around me are not closing in. I don't have to go far. None of these shafts will lead to the third floor. I only need to get far enough to pop out into one of the hospital stairwells, away from the soldiers on the first floor. I press forward. I think of Eden's face, of the medicine he and John and my mother will need, and have this strange red X with a line through it. After several minutes, the shaft dead ends. I look through the vent, and in the slivers of light I can see pieces of the curved stairwell. The floor is an immaculate white, almost beautiful, and most important, empty. I count to three in my head, then bring my arms as far back as I can and give the shaft cover a mighty shove. The cover flies off. I get one good glimpse of the stairwell, a large cylindrical chamber with tall plaster walls and tiny windows one enormous spiraling set of stairs. Now I'm moving with all speed and no stealth. Run it. I squeeze out of the the shaft and dart up the steps. Halfway up, I grab the railing and fling myself to the next highest curve. The security cameras must be focused on me. An alarm will sound any minute. Second floor, third floor. I'm running out of time. As I approach the third floor door, I tear the ID tag off my necklace and pause long enough to swipe it against the door's reader. The security cameras haven't triggered an alarm in time to lock down the stairwell. The handle clicks. I'm in. I throw open the door. I'm in a huge room filled with rows of gurneys and chemicals boiling under metal hoods. Doctors and soldiers look up at me with startled faces. 
I grab the first person I see, a young doctor standing close to the door. Before any of the soldiers can point a gun in our direction, I whip out one of my knives and hold it close to the man's throat. The other doctors and nurses freeze. Several of them scream. Shoot, and you'll hit him instead. I call out to the soldiers from beneath my handkerchief. Their guns are focused on me now. The doctor trembles in my grasp. I press my knife harder against his neck, careful not to cut him. I won't hurt you, I whisper in his ear. Tell me where to get the plague cures. He lets out a strangled whimper, and I can feel him sweating under my grip. He gestures toward the refrigerators. The soldiers are still hesitating, but one of them calls out to me. Release the doctor, he shouts. Put your hands up. I want to laugh. The soldier must be a new recruit. I cross the room with the doctor, then stop at the refrigerators. Show me. The doctor lifts a trembling hand and pulls the fr fridge door open. A gust of freezing air hits us. I wonder if the doctor can feel how fast my heart is beating. There, he whispers. I turn away from the soldiers long enough to see the doctor pointing at the top shelf in the fridge. Half of the vials on the shelf are labeled with a three-lined X. T. Filoviridae virus, mu virus mutations. The other half of the vials are labeled 11.30 cures. But all the vials are empty. They've run out. I curse under my breath. My eyes skim other shelves. They only have plague suppressants and various painkillers. I curse again. Too late to turn back now. I'm letting go, I whisper to the doctor. Duck. I release my grip and shove him hard to make him fall to his knees. The soldiers open fire, but I'm ready for them. I hide beneath the open fridge door as bullets ricochet off it. I grab several bottles of suppressants and shove them into my shirt. I bolt. One of the stray bullets scrapes me and searing pain shoots up my arm. I'm almost at the exit. An alarm goes off as I burst through the stairwell door. There's a chorus of clicks as all the doors in the stairwell lock from inside. I'm trapped. The soldiers can still come through any door, but I won't be able to get out. Shouts and footsteps echo from inside the laboratory. A voice yells out, he's hit. My eyes jump to the tiny windows in the stairwell's plaster walls. They're too far away for me to reach the stairs themselves. I grit my t teeth and pull out my second knife so that I now have one in each hand. I pray the plaster is soft enough, then leap off the stairs and throw myself toward the wall. I stab one knife straight into the plaster. My wounded arm gushes blood. I scream from the effort. I'm dangling halfway between my launching place and the window. I rock back and forth as hard as I can. The plaster is giving way. Behind me, I hear the laboratory bur door burst open and soldiers spill out. Bullets spark all around me. I swing toward the window and let go of the knife buried in the wall. The window shatters, and I'm suddenly out in the night again, and falling, falling, falling like a star to the first floor. I rip open my long sleeve shirt and let it billow behind me as thoughts zip through my head. Knees bent, feet first, relax muscles. Hit with ball, balls of feet, roll. And the ground rushes up at me. I brace myself. The impact knocks the wind out of me. I roll four times and crash into the wall on the other side of the street. For a moment, I lie there blinded, completely helpless. Above me, I can hear furious voices coming from the third floor window as the soldiers realize they're going to have to double back into the laboratory and disable the alarm. My senses gradually sharpen. Now I'm very aware of the pain in my side and arm. I use my good arm to prop myself up and wince. My chest throbs. I think I've cracked a rib. When I try to stand, I realize that I've sprained one of my ankles, too. I can't tell if my ad adrenaline is keeping me from feeling other effects of my fall. Shouts come from around the building's corner. I force myself to think. I'm now near the rear of the building, and several alleys bra branch off behind me into the darkness. I limp into the shadows. When I look over my shoulder, I can see a small group of soldiers rush to where I've fallen, pointing out the broken glass and blood. One of the soldiers is the young captain I saw earlier, the man named Matthias. He orders his men to spread out. I quickly quicken my pace and try to ignore the pain. I hunch my shoulders so the black of my outfit and hair help me melt into the darkness. My eyes stay down. I need to find a sewer cover. The edges of my vision are blurring now. I push one hand against my ear and feel for blood. Nothing yet. A good sign. Moments later, I catch sight of a sewer cap on the street. I heave a sigh, readjust the black handkerchief covering my face, and bend down to lift the cover. Freeze. Stay where you are. I whirl around to see Matthias, the young captain from the hospital's entrance, facing me. He has a gun pointed straight at my chest. But to my surprise, he doesn't fire it. I tighten my grip on my remaining knife. Something changes in his eyes. And I know he recognizes me, the boy who had pretended to stagger into the hospital. I smile. I have plenty of wounds for the hospital to treat now. 
Matthias narrows his eyes. Hands up. You're under arrest for theft, vandalism, and trespass trespassing. You're not going to take me in alive. I'd be happy to take you in dead if you prefer. What happens next is a blur. I see Matthias tense up to fire his gun. I throw my knife at him with all my strength. Before he can fire, my knife hits him hard in the so shoulder, and he falls backward with a thud. I don't wait to see him get up. I bend down and heave the manhole cover up, then lower myself down the ladder and into the blackness. I pull the sewer cover back in place. My injuries are catching up to me now. I stumble along the sewers, my vision going in and out of focus. One of my hands pressed hard against my side. I'm careful not to touch the walls. Every breath hurts. I must have cracked a rib. I'm alert enough to think about which direction I'm moving in and concentrate on heading, concentrate on heading toward the lake sector. Tess will be there. She'll find me and help me to safety. I think I can hear the rumble of footsteps overhead, the shout of soldiers. No doubt someone has discovered Matthias by now, and they might even have headed down into the sewers too. They could be hot on my trail with a pack of dogs. I make a point to take several turns and walk in the filthy sewer water. Behind me, I hear splashes and the sound of echoing voices. I take more turns. The voices get a little closer, then farther. I keep my original direction planted firmly in my mind. It would be something, wouldn't it, to escape the hospital only to die down here, lost in a gaudy maid of, maze of sewers? I count off the minutes to keep myself from passing out. Five minutes, ten minutes, thirty minutes, an hour. The footsteps behind me sound far away now, as if they are on a different path than I am. Sometimes I hear strange sounds, something like a bubbling test tube and a sigh of steam pipes, a breath of air. It comes and goes. Two hours. Two and a half hours. When I see the next ladder leading up to the surface, I take my chances and pull myself up. I'm in real danger of fainting now. It takes all my remaining strength to drag myself onto the street. I'm in a dark alley. When I've caught my breath, I blink away my fuzzy vision and study my surroundings. I can see Union Station several blocks away. I'm not far now. Tess will be there, waiting for me. Three more blocks. Two more blocks. I have one more block. I can't hold on any longer. I find a dark spot in the alley and collapse. The last thing I see is the silhouette of a girl off in the distance. Maybe she's walking toward me. I curl up and begin to fade away. Before I black out, I realize that my pendant is no longer looped around my neck. And that's where I'll stop for today. That's three chapters. So, um, what I would like you guys to think about. So tomorrow we'll do a live stream and we'll actually be able to talk about it. And you can ask questions and make comments in the, co in the comment section. I feel like a real YouTuber. Isn't this cool? Um, so you can make comments on what you thought about the chapter. If you have any questions, feel free to do that and I'll talk about it tomorrow. But what I want you to think about today so far is what do you know about the setting of this story so far? So where is this taking place? When is this taking place? What kind of feelings do you get about the world they live in? Why is it dystopian? Remember a future gone wrong? Try to figure out like, what do we know about this place so far? And I want you to think about our characters, our main characters so far. So as you can tell, our book is going to rotate between two main characters, June and Day, and our chapters are going to alternate between their two perspectives. Right now, they haven't interacted, but they will eventually meet up and we'll see the story from both of their sides. So I want you to take some time to think about their personalities and what do we know about them so far. Use some of your character traits to describe them. Um, I'm going to post something on Google Classroom so you guys can make a post on Google Classroom or feel free to put a comment here, you can respond to each other, I'll respond with you, and we'll have a virtual discussion. All right, so I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. I'll see you live from my YouTube channel, hopefully, at 10.30 a.m. Bye.